So yesterday I finished up a book called uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Um, it's, I guess, like a theological gender studies book. It's, it's quite interesting. It was recommended to me by a friend. Um, I think I'm probably going to end up doing a podcast on this book, so I am going to end up reading it again a little bit more closely. But here, I guess I'll just talk about sort of the, the arc of the book as a whole, the argument in general. Um, I mean, this sort of book, it's interesting because it sort of draws your attention to something that um, I guess I was dimly aware of before, um, but it makes it so much more um, explicit and clear that it's hard to even know, like, it's hard to reflect and be like, is this a dynamic that was, like, something I would have been thinking about if I hadn't read this book? But the short version is that um, this book has made it very, very clear to me that a big part of what's wrong with um, the evangelical movement in America is gender-related. Like, they have a extremely toxic concept of gender and especially of masculinity that um, when you sort of force it into the square hole of Christianity, it, it makes you do and say really weird things. Um, so this book is in part a history of evangelicalism, which makes it a little bit hard to summarize all in one go because evangelicalism is, you know, a complicated and multifaceted thing. And also I'm really bad at reading history. Like this type of history book, I almost always have to read more than once before it really gets in there. Um, but anyway, the the core, I think, problematic of evangelical history is the last like five, ten years where what we've seen is that the culmination of this group, the culmination of this movement in favor of family values and, you know, basic Christian decency uh, was instrumental in electing Donald Trump to the presidency. So the thing that's weird, the thing that could use some untangling is how is it that in this very, like, you know, dialectical, weird, fucked up way, a what a, a ostensibly appears to be a commitment to family values is actually an antithesis of family values. Like, yes, we're in favor of family values, but someone being a criminal and like a sexual abuser is not only excusable, but in the, is in some ways demonstrative of this person having qualities that we value in a leader. Um, so how do you like square that circle? Uh, and the answer, the answer is gender, it turns out. The answer is, um, the answer is John Wayne. The answer is that these people don't really follow Jesus, they follow cowboyness. Um, you know, they have a concept of, of Jesus that they've um, written over, the, the Jesus that actually appears in the Bible. Um, and that concept is that Jesus is like the John Wayne of the first century, um, which is... I don't know, it's super weird. Um, the one thing that the writer doesn't really spend a lot of time on is how these beliefs and approaches are justified. Because, I don't know, like, I think part of the reason that she doesn't spend any time on explaining that is that, um, is that, uh, I mean, a lot of the people who will will be reading the book will have trauma from being, like, raised evangelical or from encountering evangelicals, you know. They'll be intimately familiar with this culture. And so it won't seem that strange to those readers that um, people are capable of coming to these conclusions. But as someone who wasn't raised evangelical and wasn't, wasn't raised Christian at all, um, this stuff is really weird. <laughs> like... I don't know, the Jesus of the Bible is kind of kind of a weird hippie. And, um, and you know, there's not a lot of things that he's super duper clear on, but, like, loving your neighbors and not, like, stabbing people are two things that he's very, very clear on. And it seems like the level of, like, textual analysis that you have to be operating on is, okay, well, Jesus says love your neighbors, but he doesn't talk, he doesn't technically talk about people who, aren't my neighbors like that's the sort of loophole that you have to you have to have in order to um avoid the sort of hippie peace and love version of, of jesus um there's one um there's one bit of uh just a, a amazing 
just amazing, um, you know, lo theology loophole logic that she highlights, which is um, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, but he doesn't tell us to love his enemies. <laughs> so if someone is an enemy to you personally, you're supposed to love them. But if someone is an enemy to Jesus, you're supposed to hate them. And of course, that's a decision that, you know, we are capable of making for ourselves, you know, it's clear as day, you just encounter someone and they're like, I don't know, being too gay or something. And you're like, yeah, that's an enemy of Jesus. Um, but you know, I think that even this like very paltry theology might be overcomplicating things. Like, they just don't read the book, you know, they just don't, <laughs> they just don't like read the Bible. There's no, uh, there's no like nuanced uh, engagement with, with the scripture. And when someone is not reading the Bible and is instead just listening to what you tell them, um, you can just tell them whatever you want. And in fact, it's actually really helpful to just tell them what they think they already know, you know, give them a theological uh, justification for the things that they, they already believe. And so it seems that the evangelical movement is in large part an effort to give a theological justification to an image of masculinity and of the patriarchy in general um, that is not slowed down by the fact that the Bible sort of gets in the way of this. And unsurprisingly, you know, people who really want to justify, um, people who really want to justify the patriarchy, they lean on the Old Testament a lot because there is some really patriarchal stuff in the Old Testament. You know, the parts of the Bible that everybody else reads and they're like, ooh, don't love that that's, Oh, I don't love that that's in there. Yeah, evangelicals read that shit, and they're like, this is like the core of my belief system. Forget this Jesus guy. We need to go straight to Leviticus for the for the real stuff. Um, and then for the for the rest, they can just sort of make it up as they go along. Uh, so yeah, like I said, I'm going to be doing a podcast on this, so I'll be breaking down probably chapter by chapter what this book says, discussing it with some of my friends. But I think the thing that's been really eye-opening for me is the way in which um, gender is qu actually quite tied into the way that your theology appears in the world. I guess before reading this book, if someone had said that to me, like, how important is gender in shaping someone's theology? I would have said, well, you know, it's not unimportant, but it's definitely not the main thing. It is very clear to me <laughs> now that for some people, it is in fact the main thing, you know, like there's a, there's a group of people who their Christianity is like, how do I follow this Jesus guy without being a pussy ass bitch? And if that's your starting point, <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're going to end up somewhere really weird. You know, Christianity as a whole, it's about being a pussy ass bitch. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just what the religion is like. Um, you might not like it, but that's sort of, that's sort of what it is. And the idea is that evangelicals they can't tolerate that you know they need they need it to be a big strong man religion um essentially they want to like the way that i think about it is they want like viking shit in their um in their christianity which is you know not going to work and so the way that these two things intersect and the way that they unfold is really interesting and you know another thing is that um I think this is a, this is an idea that I will I'll have in my head while I'm rereading the book. But uh, what's interesting is these concepts and these tensions, these problems, have always been in evangelicalism. Like evangelicalism has always been a response to progressive ideas. But it's a response to feminism. It's a response to, uh, in some ways, a response to modernity. Um, and the question for me is, why is this sort of virulent strain of evangelicalism where we can be, you know, pro-rapist in pro-rapist and pro-family values? Um, why is that strain something that is appearing now rather than having appeared in like the 60s, right? <sighs> yeah, and I guess, I, I guess that's an interesting question. I mean, I think it in part it has to do with political polarization. Um, it has to do with the way that like national politics has been reshaped. People have started saying the quiet part out loud. Um, I think it has to do with increasing acceptance of non-standard gender roles. You know, like back in the 60s when it was like, you know, these things were being presented as like, should we let the freaks be freaks? 
it, it was sort of easy to not say the quiet part out loud, but now that the freaks have a seat at the table, uh, it, it becomes more and more difficult to express a conservative view towards these things without just saying out loud why you have that conservative view. And once, you ha once you're forced to be explicit about why you have those beliefs, where they're coming from, why you think they're valuable, um, you know, once you have to justify those beliefs fully rather than them just being sort of connected to common sense, once you have to justify them, they sound pretty fucking awful. Um, so now people are having to justify them, and surprise, surprise, they sound pretty awful. Um, anyway, yeah, this, uh, this video has probably been not very satisfying to watch because I don't have any huge conclusions about this book. It's interesting, it's a new way of thinking about, about conservative theology that I hadn't considered before. And, uh, yeah, more, more thoughts incoming, I guess. <laughs> Prepare yourself for more thoughts. Okay, bye-bye.